Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, last week on social media, people were greeted by uh, this little video from China showing the remains of a Long March 3B rocket falling back to Earth. This is a booster from a Long March 3B, which was being used to launch two new satellites for China's Beidou um, GPS equivalent, their uh, geolocation system, which is actually an improvement over GPS right now. The rocket launches with four boosters and they burn out at about uh, 127 seconds after launch. They are liquid propellant boosters running hypergolic uh, dinitrogen tetroxide and unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine. Which makes this video of locals standing next to the burning booster scary because these propellants are essentially explosive toxic carcinogens of the worst kind. If you ever see orange smoke coming off a rocket, it's probably because they're using uh, nitrogen-rich uh, hypergolic fuels. And even if the main booster doesn't use them, it's highly likely that the payload will use them because hypergolic propellants are the best choice for uh, deep space use. Similarly, when an entire proton rocket crashed into the ground, again, the signature orange smoke is there. Regardless of the toxicity of the propellants, I hear you wondering, is it normal for rocket launches in China to drop chunks of rockets on China? And the answer is yes. I mean, many of the launch sites in China are in the middle of the country. Their earliest launch sites were actually very close to Russia, as they originally worked with the Soviet Union, but later they broke off and worked, developed their own uh, program. And so they moved their launch sites into remote mountain locations so that nobody could spy on them. Either way, they were still launching rockets and dropping stages all over the country. This particular launch from Qichang uh, headed southeastwards uh, because it was trying to send the satellites into a 55 degree inclination orbit, and about 700 kilometers downrange, the boosters fell. Now, this wasn't a surprise for the locals, they had been informed, and while they can't target the spent stages with the precision that SpaceX exhibits, they can at least try to drop it in the less populated parts of the region. The Long March launch vehicle is about 450 tons at launch and can put about 11.5 tons into low Earth orbit. Now, this booster is about 15 metres tall, 2.5 metres wide, and uh, it masses about 40 tonnes at launch. By the time it lands, it's uh, only a few tonnes. Now, China's not the only country that has been dropping spent boosters all over the place. Uh, Russia's been doing it forever as well. In fact, there was apparently a uh, recycling industry that kind of kicked built up around the recycling of the uh, Soyuz boosters. And there's some really good photos of these landed piece of hardware. It's quite amazing that they actually uh, maintain their shape. I'm guessing that these boosters are largely fuel tank, and so as they're falling through the atmosphere, yes, they are falling from space, that their terminal velocity must be quite low because they're largely empty volume. Certainly, they're more recognizable than, say, aircraft which have fallen from the sky. It's not about how far you fall, but about how fast you hit the ground. And curiously enough, despite Britain being surrounded by water, their uh, limited space program launched rockets out of Woomera in Australia, and those spent stages landed in the outback, and there's one which has been recovered and put on display. Again, it's in surprisingly good shape, considering that it essentially fell from space. But the US, Europe, and India, they're all launching spacecraft over the oceans and dropping the stages in there. And it's only SpaceX that are really bringing them back home right now. The solid rocket boosters on the Ariane 5 were designed to be recovered for just post-flight analysis. They were never reused, but they have been brought back to shore after a soft landing in the, in the Atlantic. The US requirement to launch over water actually is the reason why there's two major launch sites. On the east coast you have of course Cape Canaveral which is primarily used for low inclination launches whereas on the west coast you have Vandenberg which is there if you need to go into uh, polar orbits. It's kind of difficult to put a rocket into a polar orbit from Cape Canaveral because uh, you would have to tr fly south over Miami, and I don't think the residents of Miami would be particularly happy with that. However, it was recently announced that the powers that be have come up with a launch profile which would allow polar launches out of uh, Florida. The rocket would actually have to start by heading out to sea and then take a, a right-hand turn to head south and carefully drop its stages before they uh, end up flying over Cuba. 
The exact trajectory hasn't been disclosed as far as I know, but they did say that uh, the rockets would require to have onboard automated flight termination systems, which means that SpaceX's Falcon is the only rocket that would be allowed to do this at this time. And SpaceX are committed to Vandenberg. I hear they just got approval to do rocket landings there. They cleared uh, the sonic booms with the locals. I don't doubt that they prefer the location. After all, it is a little closer to their factory in Hawthorne. Now, returning to the Chinese space program, we of course have the case of Tiangong-1, which was their space station, uh, but now it is drifting essentially out of control. It has not been under their control for a long time, and it is in a decaying orbit. It is expected to fall to Earth probably in March at this time. And unfortunately, nobody can really say where it could land. So people are understandably concerned that a very large chunk of space hardware is going to re-enter without any control. However, the fashionable place for a dead space hardware to land is in the South Pacific. There is a place called Point Nemo, which is 1,500 miles from the nearest land. And if a satellite owner can pick the time and place of a spacecraft's demise, that is the place to be. It's where Mir landed and over 250 other pieces of uh, dead satellites. And of course, it's very likely that the International Space Station, or at least the parts of it which get decommissioned, will end up at the end of its life. But before you get excited, uh, just remember this is a very large piece of ocean, and uh, you're very unlikely to find any pieces of satellites. After all, they did mostly break up during re-entry. However, there have been a few significant discarded pieces of space hardware recovered from the ocean floor. First of all, there was the Liberty Bell. That was Gus Grissom's Mercury capsule, which sank to the bottom after the hatch blew accidentally. Secondly, there were the first stage engines from Apollo 12. These giant F-1 engines, of course, are the still the largest rocket engines ever built. And these were recovered by Jeff Bezos, so they were 14,000 feet down on the ocean floor of the Atlantic. So yeah, the next time you see a perfect landing of a Falcon 9 booster, give a thought to all the other pieces of space hardware which aren't coming back in quite so controlled a manner. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.